Innovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Finnovate podcast. Joining me today, we have Tillman Urbeck, Managing Partner at Flourish Ventures. Tillman, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you for having me. Looking forward. So as a quick introduction, can you just give us a background on Flourish Ventures and kind of some idea of where your perspective is coming from? Yes, happy to do that. So we are an early stage equity investor with purpose, we like to say. What does that mean? It means we do back entrepreneurs who typically have come up with tech-led innovations that help people improve their economic and financial outlook. We want each prospective portfolio company to have a clear idea of how they can do good and well individually. And then collectively, we invest uh, in themes, in a series of companies behind a theme, typically across different markets. And we hope that the sex- successful demonstration effect, if you will, of, uh, of these themes can change industry structures and incumbent behavior, always for the better. Excellent. No, I think it's fascinating the, the tack that you guys have taken and the emphasis that you've put on this sort of socially conscious investing, you know, really looking at solutions that can help low and middle income households, small businesses, really just anybody who sort of needs that boost to be able to take control of their financial future. Can you talk a little bit about where that drive comes from at Flourish Ventures? Yeah, our initial impetus definitely came from our source of capital, and that is Keo Media, uh, the founder of eBay. Uh, eBay, as, as you know, was a real pioneer 20 years ago uh, in creating opportunities for people. There were early studies that showed that millions of new livelihoods were created on eBay. So Pierre really strongly believed in or believes in the potential of entrepreneurship, tech-led innovation, the power of private sector investment discipline to make a positive difference. And and we at Flourish share that belief, uh, our team. Uh, We also share the realization that tech and finance can inadvertently do harm. So we actually have articulated a series of principles of what we believe a fair financial retail system would look like. And those principles a guide what we are excited about and what we are less excited about. Ultimately, we want to improve the system so that it can help people uh, improve their economic outlook and their financial health. Certainly, when you look at kind of the the founding coming from eBay, obviously, you could do a a lot on eBay. People have done huge amounts of studies on everything that they have done, but a massive game changer early on in the fintech space. But one of the big things that came from that is this democratization of access to a payment system, which you're right, really did allow people a lot more flexibility to go in and create opportunities for themselves, which is really interesting, I think, to that, that is sort of continuing to carry on. Um, so, you know, when we look at 2021, you're predicting that a lot of venture capitalists will be looking more at the social impact of their investments and not just as kind of the economic impact, the return that they'll get. What do you think is driving that shift right now? Well, let me first say that we don't believe that there's an inevitable trade-off between doing good and well. Uh, That doesn't mean that all socially oriented investments can deliver risk adjusted commercial returns, but there's no automatic trade off. And if you think about it, uh, doing the right thing by your customer and delivering truly new or superior, uh, a truly new or superior value proposition, that is obviously very viable And I think it strikes just a chord in the context of the current crises around the pandemic, the economic downturn, that that if we can see opportunities to do good and well, by all means, let's do that. And I think capital markets more broadly have recognized that. Uh, That's particularly true with respect to environmental risks. Uh, Larry Fink, BlackRock, right, has put everybody on notice, and and venture capital increasingly recognizes that as well. We can go into a couple of examples if that's helpful to you. 
Yeah, I'd love to hear some examples. I think it's really interesting. You know, then coming back to one of your points, it's not a dichotomy. It's not something that's one or the other. You either are socially responsible or you're turning a profit. I think it's something which a lot of people who aren't as familiar with this kind of, you know, looking at the social impact of these investments don't always see that. So yeah, some some examples of types of solutions that you've seen who've been able to kind of walk this line and, and find the right balance, I think would be really interesting. So I start in emerging markets. It's actually easier and more obvious to see in emerging markets because they are traditionally large swath of society have operated in the informal economy and outside of the traditional banking system because the traditional banking system was just too expensive and couldn't reach them. And so all the innovations typically riding the mobile telephone and the ubiquity of mobile connection now, these innovations that provide credit on the basis of new data sources that provide insurance at the point of service. There's a whole swath of things that we have invested in that, uh, that meet this test of, of doing good and doing, doing well. In, in the US, for example, we invested early on in a company called EBT Fresh. They, they serve uh, food stamp recipients. And it was initially an app that help with budgeting and just helping people better manage their benefit. And because that was so useful, they had literally viral marketing, very low customer acquisition cost. And in the early months of the pandemic, right, monthly active users accelerated up to 5 million and more. And now EBT Fresh can provide services that go beyond the original budgeting. They want to basically build a new bank or new bank functionality for low income consumers in the US. And we were at first, and we were an early investor in the company. And subsequently, a number of big guys have invested alongside us. So, so this is clearly, there are ways uh, where as we said earlier, where there is no dichotomy and where you can do good and well. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the things you know, people sometimes look at emerging markets, and obviously that is sort of the low-hanging fruit when it comes to really tackling the kind of unbanked, underbanked. There are so many people in those emerging markets. Um, but that can also be really daunting for people who are looking to get into the space on a more local level. And I think really looking at not just what's happening elsewhere around the world, but looking at what's happening inside the United States and the communities within our own country that need to be better served by the financial institutions that are out there. There certainly are opportunities there. And a lot of times something really good can spiral from an idea that's just sort of targeted in the right way with the right type of mentality behind it. Now, now you brought up something really interesting here. You kind of mentioned neobank functionality. And this is actually a question that I had. Are, a lot of neobanks are really interested in the social aspect of what they're working on. You know, we've seen that pattern from the Finnovate side. Do you think neobanks are better positioned to deliver more socially responsible banking than traditional banks are? Yes, we think they can do that, in particular in advanced economies. And I'll come back to that in a second. And why can they do that? They, they are digitally native. They don't have a costly branch infrastructure. They are not encumbered by legacy IT systems. So they can do things differently and at a very different cost structure, much more cheaply. And so in the US, based on the interchange fee income alone, to begin with, they can provide a free transaction account, no minimum balance requirements, no hidden overdraft fees or hidden other fees. Um, and based on sustained engagement and, and learning about their user base, they can then add in truly attractive additional features like an instant crediting of your paycheck rather than as traditional banks tend to do right, waiting for a couple of days and, and earn some float income, or, or they can build savings, habits, and credit worthiness. So in neobanks definitely uh, deliver a superior value proposition. And that does help lower income people um, or young folks who just start out a professional career. But frankly, it is a superior value proposition to everybody. 
Yeah, I mean, there's so many aspects of the banking model, the traditional banking model that really just have been proven to be inefficient. And I think the question is, can you separate that old model from those inefficiencies or do you just have to kind of chuck it all out and start over again and build something new? And you know, interesting to kind of hear your perspective that maybe just starting new, starting with a completely new system allows you to build something that's more efficient, that allows you to go out and reach targeted customers, types of customers that you hadn't been able to reach before. So um, I think that's a really interesting takeaway and certainly a challenge to be thrown down to a lot of the traditional financial institutions in the United States. Clearly, you know, the big guys aren't going anywhere, but it is, you know, we are seeing more and more these new banks coming in and really tackling some of these inefficiencies that haven't been properly addressed by the financial system, despite, quite frankly, quite a bit of time that they've had to, to work on the problem. So um, last question, we're, we're coming up on the end of our time here, but you know, at the end of the year, we always like to look forward and talk about what's coming next. So you know, big picture, what are you excited by as you look towards 2021? You know, we started investing seven, eight years ago um, based on first principles, right? What were just better, faster, cheaper ways of doing things? And we had great tailwinds already in the last couple of years. And frankly, the pandemic and the economic lockdowns have, have further accelerated these tailwinds, right? People are changing behaviors uh, more rapidly than we expected. And we could really see a very different industry structure emerging, depending a little bit of regulatory forbearance and or regulatory flexibility. Um, you could imagine, you mentioned earlier eBay and payments. You could imagine that the the, the front end of the retail relationship or the customer relationship in financial services is actually much more naturally owned by the big platforms that are relevant in our lives and that we use daily. That could be social media, it could be e-commerce, it could be platforms that help us to find jobs and make a living. And these platforms obviously need to be regulated and they need to be connected with regulated balance sheets at the back end, and somebody needs to connect all this. So we really see great opportunities in what people now call embedded finance, finance embedded in these type of platforms, and then in B2B fintech infrastructure. And, and we have already invested, we had already invested in these themes before the crisis, and we are really now seeing an acceleration, and we have accelerated in our efforts. And we very much expect that to continue for several years to come. Sure. And no, I think we're already seeing the beginnings of that. What we've seen so far this year or the tail end of this year at Finnovate, I think would, would absolutely bear that out. You know, we've seen a lot of people who are looking at painful moments in their customers' lives and trying to help out there. We've also seen a number of companies who are innovating around kind of a core banking space, opening up the opportunity for banks to engage with fintech more and in a more productive way than they have been, which is also really interesting to see. Um, and, and I think you're right, you know, looking at what's coming next, there are going to be some big picture changes in customer behavior, which are going to require some changes from the banking side of things as well. Customers are moving quickly now, and the pandemic has certainly accelerated people's adoption of digital banking services. And it's going to be really interesting to see how that continues to unfold. This has been, you know, a watershed moment in many ways. And we will, I think you're right, continue to see people moving that direction. And uh, it'll be fascinating to watch the space and which banks are able to pivot and make an adjustment and kind of meet their customers where they are, which new banks are going to pop up and exploit some of those gaps left by the traditional players. And of course, with all of these stories, there's opportunity for fintech companies to come in and support those endeavors. So, um, well, Tillman, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening.